we had a very cool assignment recently. It was for Mattel, the toy company. Do you know Mattel? Yeah, they make pretty much everything I grew up with. This was the holy grail for me. Less so. Um, Hot Wheels, absolutely. This is me doing very early consumer research. And I know what you're thinking right now, so I need to say it out loud. You're saying, Todd, I want to be an innovation. Where can I get that sweater? And the answer is, you can't get it. It is an innovation sweater. But I need to tell you about their design center, of which we took a tour. Um, three things about it, really. The first is that it is everything that you would want a design center to be. OK, it's very cool. Um, it's every toy, every material, every color, everything you ever wanted, everything you couldn't afford in one space, the size of an airplane hangar. It's that good. The second is a statistic. 80%. 80% of the things that were on the shelf every year from Mattel were not there the year before. 80%. If you're in the innovation world, that's a big number. That's actually a very big number because of the screen, but it's also a very large number. This is the holy grail, though. At the end of the tour, we got to the superhero section. And if you like toys, that is not a small thing. And we were sitting in kind of, you know, by a sketch of Batman and a sketch of Superman. And they were describing the difference between them from a business perspective. And apparently there is one. So here it is. Superman is born perfect. He has x-ray vision. He's bulletproof. He can fly around the world. He is born that way. Batman. Batman is human. He's a very talented human. He's a very talented human, but he's human nonetheless. And how does he do super things? through training, and tools, and gadgets, and capabilities, and all of these amazing things that get him from where he is to super. But at the end of the day, he's human. Now, this matters to people at Mattel. By the way, look at super. He is in his underwear, literally, OK? Talk about being born, ready to go. The guy gets up in the morning, bing, fights crime, OK? Needs no help. That's confidence. That's born with it. But Mattel, from a children's perspective, they know that actually children don't necessarily identify with that. They don't identify with being born perfect. They identify, but by the way, kids are not perfect. They identify with wanting to be better. They identify with taking on all these gadgets and tools and training and tricks, and they love it. And so when there is a business decision to make, let's say two movies coming out at the same time, Mattel knows always to go with Batman. It was cool. It was an interesting thing to learn. But it made me think uh, a little bit about innovation. Um, because we use the Superman lens all the time to talk about innovation. You are born with it. Innovators, they come out of nowhere. Look at this guy. I don't even like his face, but look at that face. Smug. I'm going to show up. I'm going to come out of nowhere. You're not going to know exactly what you're asking for, because when most people ask for innovation, they don't. But uh, you're not going to know how I do it. But you'll know it when you see it. Superman. But at Mattel, for the assignment we were brought in for, I looked at the team that we had brought. Actually, the, the, the people from Fahrenheit 2 on 2, the innovation consultancy that I lead, they were an architect, industrial designer, graphic designer, 
a recovering investment banker, a strategist. So who are those people? Very talented people like you, but people who are given, well, they're very talented, they're very creative, but they're people who are given tools and training. Now, this is the same team that in the same year as that assignment developed wearables for Samsung, a food platform for Nestle, payment tools for a bank. Now they're being asked to develop a new toy platform for Mattel. How are they going to do it? Through tools and training. Okay, so if they're not born with it, but we take talented people and give them tools and training at Mattel, and this is serious, I actually had this thought. Holy shit, I'm Batman. <laughs> yes, and if that's true, we probably need to stop talking about innovation like something to be studied in the past. Maybe we've read the books on it, but all of the analytics that we do about how innovation has worked, and maybe we need to stop talking about innovation in the predictive sense, about what will happen as futurists. And instead, if that's true, maybe we need to start working on the tools and the training right now for the people that are doing it right now. And that's what I want to talk to you today about today. I'm going to do it through the tools uh, and the lens of Fahrenheit 212 and some of our work. So we're going to do it three ways, okay? We're going to keep the superhero metaphor run right into the ground. We're going to capture lightning on demand. We are going to crack a safe. We're going to defuse a time bomb. Three very superhero-ish things. But in doing so, hopefully we can show that innovation is a discipline. And it's incredibly creative. And it's incredibly powerful. But it doesn't need to be mystical. And it doesn't need to be unpredictable. Should we get started? All right, let's start with lightning. Lightning is defined by being bold, powerful, intense. But lightning is also defined by being unpredictable. We talk about ideas this way, don't we? It hit me like a bolt of lightning. I couldn't figure it out. I was, you know, I was, just, uh, I was stuck in the room for so long, and then bang, hit me. How do we make, how do we make that more predictable? How do we make innovation more predictable? This is what's called a transparent LCD screen. Actually, this is the first prototype that Samsung gave to us. I don't think we gave it back. Um, it didn't really work well. They don't want it back. Um, but what it is, just very clearly, it's, a, it's what it sounds like, right? It's an LCD screen. We all know them with the backlight taken out so you can see what's on the screen, but you can also see what's behind it. Two problems with this technology when Samsung brought it to us. Number one, and not a good TV. Resolution, you can kind of see it there, is not very good. So if you're looking for a cool new version of a TV, look elsewhere. Problem number two, and maybe some of you are picking up on this, we can all probably think of some cool places where this could live. But there's not a clear role for this in society right now. You can probably think of a couple places it could be, but does Samsung have a right to make a business out of this? Okay, let's tackle this together then. What's the first thing we do? Actually, let's start with the Superman lens. How many post-it notes have we seen over the last three days on screen? Post it no time. This is our what if moment, right? I get to say what if, or I get kicked out of the conference. This is it, right? We go, we start putting things on, we start putting uh, ideas on there, we go wide. It's brainstorming time. We go very wide. And somebody, I'll, I'll step aside and just, just say this, and some of you might be in here. Somebody in this room always says the following. This always kills me. Hey guys. There are no bad ideas. <laughs> you ever heard that? 
Okay. Of course there are bad ideas. Of course there are bad ideas. There's time and a place for brainstorming, but of course there are. Um, look, my house is on fire. Water is a good idea. Breakdancing is a bad idea. There's plenty <laughs> of, of times and places for ideation. Um, I'm picking on brainstorming here. By the way, we use it. I'm sure you use it too. But in terms of reliably getting to good ideas, efficiently, it's probably not the most efficient way. At least we found in Fahrenheit's experience. So, let's move uh, into the Batman, a little more learned approach, a little, little more of a learned discipline way. And what we say here is first, before you decide to brainstorm, you better know what a good idea looks like. It's worth taking the time to figure that out. At Fahrenheit, we have a process called two sided problems and two sided solutions. That means there is no such thing as an idea unless it does two things. It solves a problem for the consumer and it solves a problem for the business. You can't call it an idea unless it's done both of those things at the same time. Sometimes those are very different parts of the idea. We have another name for that. We call it money and magic. This is a little bit of our internal approach. This is our two-sided process. A money team responsible for solving for the business early. What's a cool new business model? How's this going to work? A magic team, idea development team, or design teams solving for the consumer. Money and magic. Now, this is a bit of a break from how this used to be, innovation used to be done in the past. You probably know this, but it was done, innovation, five, ten years ago, two types of firms. On one hand, management consultants. On the other hand, design firms only. Management consultants. Anyone worked with the McKinsey's of the world, the BCG's of the world? What are you going to get? You're going to get amazing linear thinking, really good use of data, and they're going to tell you where to go. They're going to tell you where the opportunity is. What are they not going to do? Give you a really big idea to put into that space. They don't even try, right? It's not their job. Their job is to go, okay, here's where the money is. I can prove it from the data. Go. Design firms and design-only firms tend to fail in exactly the opposite way. They don't always, but sometimes. Amazing ideas for consumers. Big creative thinking, but sometimes they risk treating the needs of the business, operational realities, manufacturing capabilities, margin, strategy, as afterthoughts, something to be solved later after we have our big idea, <laughs> instead of half of the problem to be solved in parallel. Money and Magic says we need to do both of these things at once. There's a lot of needs of the business. Half of the best ideas you will ever see come from this side. Netflix, Zipcar, these are business model innovation with great consumer experience about them. The other half will come from this side. At Fahrenheit, we don't care where it comes from because we need both sides. When you do this, not in sequence, but in parallel, in tandem, and sometimes intention on purpose. What comes out is more powerful and more predictable. Here's another number. 15%. So, 15% is the hit rate, the commercialization rate, of a funnel process. You know what a funnel process is? It's, it's, it's a, basically, let's come up with all the ideas that we can, all the ideas, and then later, let's figure out if it's a good business later on. 15%, naturally, it's a funnel that's going to work like that, right? So 15% of that stuff gets to market. And that's fine. It's actually not bad, 15%, 17%, depending on who you're talking to. Here's another number. That's the hit rate of a two-sided process. That's the Fahrenheit 212 hit rate. Why? Because we don't have to guess if the business can accept it. It was built that way. That, by the way, is lightning in a bottle. What I want to show you now is the effect of a two-sided process. Remember uh, transparent LCD? 
All right, well, let's take a look at the outcome of, two, of a two-sided process. It may not be what you're expecting, but remember the process here is to find as many wins as we can for the business, for the consumer, for the entire ecosystem. So I'll play that now. This is a video prototype that we do internally a few years ago, just to understand what this is. To everyone in and around the food business, cold stuff is pretty hot these days. Grocers are loving the cold, hard cash of frozen foods, now one of their most profitable categories. Trouble is, all this cool success has driven proliferation, making it easy for consumers to get lost in the frost and harder for brands to get noticed when it matters most. But there's a revolution coming to change all that. Illumina, the living freezer by Samsung. Powered by Samsung's amazing translucent ambient LCD technology, Illumina catapults commercial refrigeration out of the ice age to a dynamic velocity building future. Simply by layering A LCD panels into the door glass connected wirelessly to a simple content management platform, amazing new outcomes come into view. In the once foggy freezer section, consumers can easily find what they're after and find out what they want to know. Brands get a powerful new way to influence decisions where they happen, deliver branded messaging, and help new items get noticed. Retailers get a new promotion engine and a revenue stream selling door time. And freezer OEMs give their installed customer base a big reason to upgrade. In all these applications, the translucency of Illumina's ambient LCD strikes a perfect balance between attracting attention, respecting the setting that surrounds it, and not overwhelming consumers, driving preference and elevating consumer experiences. And since it recycles the backlight that's already there, it uses less energy of an ordinary LCD. Put it all together, and Illumina is a powerful cold fusion of functional storage, improved consumer navigation, a revenue driver for retailers, and a potent new way for brands to win at the moment decisions are made. Taking commercial refrigeration out of the ice age to a dynamic new future. Illumina, the living freezer by Samsung. Cool. Now, you might have seen there a bunch of wins, a win for the retailer, win for the food manufacturer, actually a new platform, a new ad platform, better experience for the, cons for the customer, frozen food aisle is terrible, and of course a, a win for Samsung, and a place where that technology that's a bad TV can actually work. So how do we solve two-sided solutions? So how do we solve to control for lightning? It's two-sided solutions. That's our answer. Let's move on quickly and crack our safe. First, imagine a safe. Save the time, imagine that safe. It's something that we want to get into, but we can't, and the way we're going to get into it is heat. So what's the first thing that we do? Take all of our resources, and we point it at the safe. And what happens? Nothing. We have a relatively warm, unopened safe. Fine, so we change tactics. Let's take all of our heat, and we're going to focus it. We're going to narrow it into a beam that is now a laser-like beam. We focus it, and what happens? We're able to get through. We're able to get the opportunity inside. Now, does the way that we did it, going narrow, change the size of the opportunity inside? No. So why in the world of innovation are there so many warm safes? ideas that are really interesting, but, but kind of all over the place. This is one of the most underrated skills in innovation. We love to go big. We need to go big. It's one of Fahrenheit's hallmarks, is big, creative thinking. But the thing that needs to be taught as much as going, as going big is how to go small. Sometimes we have to go small before we can go big. I want to show you how this plays out with a recent assignment to crack a loyalty program. A little while ago, a very successful hotel conglomerate came to us and said, can you please advance our loyalty program? It's not broken, but we just need it to be better. So what do they do? And this probably happens in your world too. They ask their consumers, and their consumers told them, well, we want more points and we want more rewards. So that's what they did. And they warmed the safe didn't really have the impact. So they gave it to Fahrenheit 212. And this is where I would love, love, 
to tell you that in 24 hours we cracked it. A few drinks later, and I will tell you that, because I'm not above that. But what actually happened was we came up with um, deeply creative ideas that did the exact same thing. We warmed the safe as well. And what we have at this point is a very hot safe. You could fry an egg on it, but we, we actually can't get into it. So that was the problem until we went smaller, and I want to do this together. So I'm going to very quickly show you how we go smaller before we uh, come up with an idea. So first thing we're going to do, let's take create loyalty. Let's break it into its levers. Consumer journey, lifetime value, competitive offerings, consumer offerings, commercial levers, lock-in periods, digital interactions. Do you really want to fight all of those battles at once? Yeah, we didn't either. So we went smaller again, and we said, okay, let's take, tell you what, let's just go small. We're going to put this into transactional loyalty and human loyalty. What's transactional loyalty? Points, rewards, leveling up, status. Fine, we understand that. Plenty of people working on that. What is human loyalty? It's the actual feeling between two real life human beings. Respect, dignity, feeling valued. Fine, right? We just took create loyalty, we went smaller, we cut it in half, and we said, let's only focus on human loyalty. But then we went smaller again. And here's how small we went. Not just to human loyalty, because that's actually pretty big. We went to a moment. Let me know if this moment is familiar to you. You have a job. You travel. You've been traveling for five years. And for five years, you've had status, because you've just been there enough. You're gold or platinum or whatever. And then, one year, in the sixth year, you get promoted. And you don't need to travel as much, because that's the entire point of being promoted. You don't have to, you make somebody else travel. Fine. So, but, you know, once in a while you're still on the road. You get back to that hotel where you had status. You get up to the desk, and you expect to be treated like the same person you were for five years, and they pretend not to know you because you didn't push that boulder up the hill for 12 consecutive months to hit the levels that you needed to hit. Think about that moment. That's not a moment where loyalty is in question. That is a moment where I may hate your hotel. It's actually, um, and you're probably picking up on some of this, what we're talking about here in Going Smaller is innovation strategy. It is a skill set. It's a type of strategy that we teach. It's the big choice behind the big ideas. It's a major part of our process. I hope it's part of yours. This is actually the story behind Star Wars Preferred Guests and a particular, um, particular um, advancement of that program that we made a few years ago, where we said, look, at some point, you're going to stop going backward. And we're going to take this idea, all, this strategy, all the way down from, let's create loyalty, all the way down from, let's solve for that one moment. I want to show you, and this is old, but I want to show you the original internal version of that idea. Hotel rewards programs are all the same. There's you, a mountain, a rock, and a clock. Your job is to push the rock up the mountain in 12 months or less. Go far enough, fast enough, and you make gold or platinum. Reach the top, and there's nowhere else to go. Slow down, and you go backwards. But all that's about to change forever. Starwood introduces Infinity, the world's first progressive rewards program. Infinity is a simple revolution with just one rule. You always move forward, which means you never go back to a lower level of status and rewards, and you never top out on a plateau. You see, starting now and for the rest of your life, Infinity will offer you better and better rewards every five nights you stay with us. The more you stay with us, the more points each night is worth. The better we get to know you, and the nicer your rewards become. And it's not all about how many nights you've spent with us this year. It's based on a lifetime of loyalty. Those nights you spent with us three years ago count as much as the one next week. It's the end of What Have You Done For Me Lately rewards programs, and the beginning of Loyalty For Life, a relationship that just keeps getting better and better and better. Add infinitum. Hey.
Infinity by SPG, the world's first progressive rewards program. Forever forward. That is actually a very, very simple idea. In a day and a weekend full of really creative ideas, that's a very simple one. Where's the creativity and how we went smaller? In the creative strategy behind it, it was narrow enough that it became our laser, powerful enough to cut through our safe. All right, let's finish up. Let's defuse our time bomb. This is an ugly metaphor, which I should apologize for, but we've all been on time bomb situations, and here's what I mean by that. Innovation assignments can be great because they want growth. There are a lot of firms and clients that don't just want growth, they need growth. They're losing margin, they're losing share, they're losing customers, maybe they're lagging behind in the adoption of a new technology. Think of the environment in some of your projects in situations like this. Internal politics, anxiety, pressure, time matters. And here we train at Fahrenheit to look for a particular kind of insight. I say that because typically in innovation assignments, we like to gather as much insight as we can. The problem is there is a risk there. We like also like to solve as much as we can. And when we do that, we create a bunch of incremental solutions that aren't wrong, but did they really get them out of the big problem that they had? Let's just take it for an example, a uh, digital banking experience, another customer. Imagine if you had to solve for a bank that was in trouble. Where would you start? Authentication, security, navigation, customer service on the phone. Really, what, where would you begin? The way we say it, we say, you can only cut one wire in these situations. Which wire do you cut? We train to, in, in time bomb situations, to look for something that can have a chain reaction. There are plenty of great ideas. We are hunting for the one idea that can have a huge chain reaction impact, affecting as many things as possible after it. That's the goal here. We call that, and I've heard this a couple times uh, throughout the weekend, and I, I love it when I hear it, we call that at Fahrenheit the problem behind the problem. That's the only thing we're looking for in a time bomb situation. What's the one thing that if we changed would have the greatest impact? And by the way, you can map, this is where what if, remember I kind of was a little, a little tough on what if at brainstorming time? This is where what if is incredibly useful. You can map scenarios. You can quantify them if you're so inclined. You can say, if we did this, what are all the things that would happen afterward? And figure out which is the right wire to cut Okay, let's do this quickly for um, cutting one wire. Let's use the word transparency differently, though. It's transparency for banking customers. What if I um, let them see where an issue was so they didn't have to call in every time and they could see where things were? What if every fee they could see at all times? And we defined the entire experience based on transparency. What would happen? Well, let's take a quick look. Let's say we added a lot more visibility. People would probably know where they stood at all times. Maybe they would call and ask about it a lot less. That would actually create a lower service cost for the business, wouldn't it? You get a customer that feels more in control. You'll get a CFO who feels more in control. Pretty good wire. Pretty impactful problem behind the problem to solve. Yeah, so this is where I'd like to show you um, what's coming out here. But as of two days ago, I'm gonna say this slowly because it kills me, we did not receive permission from the bank to show you the work based on transparency. <laughs> so we can't actually show you exactly what's coming out, but if, you, if that kind of sticks in you, you know a lot about banking where it is today and why it's in the situation that it is. But can you cut the right wire? Think of the projects that you're on right now. Think of if you are on a time bomb situation. Think about mapping some of the impact. That's what we're looking for. So we covered three things quickly. Two-sided solutions going smaller to go bigger. 
talked about the problem behind the problem, and these are just a few of many. But they help us get beyond post-it notes, and they help us get beyond randomness that is associated with innovation. So here's the truth. We need both Batman and Superman. For the Superman inclined, sorry, for the Batman inclined, let's talk to the Batman first, you should know innovation is a discipline. You can train, you can practice, you can get better. For the Superman inclined, and there's a little of both in both of us, but I'm pulling them apart on purpose. For the Superman inclined, know that a little process does not compete with creativity. It actually embraces it and enables it. Quick example, in between an artist and art, inspiration, process, experimentation, getting rid of that process altogether, trying new things, there's plenty of things in the middle in deeply creative processes. Speaking of art, I want to show you what happened at Mattel. So, at Mattel, they had asked us to help them think about getting into the art supply category. It's a place where they had a lot of, so they have a lot of big franchises. They didn't really have a way to play, so to speak, in art and art supplies. So they asked us to take a look. Take a look at this and see if you can spot any of our three plays. Kids' arts world looks a lot like the fragmented music business before Apple got there. There's a disorganized, growing mountain of kid-created content in every home, a hard time managing it, no easy way to share it or take it with you, and a desire to never part with it. As Apple showed, owning content management opens the door to product innovations, multiple revenue streams, and a high-value, data-rich, direct relationship with the customer, which Mattel opens now through a new innovation platform called Art Capture through an integrated system of products called Galleria. Galleria marries products and digital services that foster the validation kids get from creating art and showing it to people who love them. Galleria easels are both the physical catalyst for creation and the portal to the ecosystem. Its core is the ability to digitally capture kids' art created at home or brought home from school, then instantly push their masterpieces to a controlled personal network of friends and family and to a user-friendly cloud-based archive where they can be browsed anytime, anywhere, by anyone in the private network via our app or website. Kids are empowered to easily, instantly, and safely share their creations at their easel or via the app and feel the pride of accomplishment that feedback brings. Mom and Dad get a way to organize, browse, and permanently archive their kids' creations and stoke their passions. Loved ones across town or across the world feel more connected. Hosting the images lets us monetize ways the family can apply them. Over time, we build valuable customer data, preferences, and profiles, and replace the battle for one-off retail sales with an enduring relationship with recurring revenue opportunities like subscription art supplies, storage, online tools and art classes, gifting, and ordering hot new products at holiday time. Put it all together, and it's a big opportunity in a big Mattel white space, unleashed by one simple truth. If you own the content and the relationship, the only limit is your imagination. The Art Capture Platform, capturing imagination. You might have seen two-sided solutions there, not just something for the consumer, but actually a new channel for Mattel. You may have seen a very specific way to play, not just in art, but the idea of art capture. That's where we went narrow. And as a result, you may have seen the problem behind the problem. All that art piling up in parents' basement, that they don't really want to get rid of. Now, at Fahrenheit 212, we have, we love ideation and we love big thinking. It's our lifeblood. But we also run over 40 plays, like some of the three plays we showed you here. We're killing half of them, we're inventing new ones. We need to experiment like that. If you touch the world of innovation, I hope that you are too. Of course, we, we need that to grow our economies, our companies, and our clients. But the same process here that's built for big thinking can be applied anywhere. Innovation is a discipline. You can fight poverty. 
You can reinvent healthcare. Think of it this way. Innovation already has plenty of historians, has plenty of futurists trying to predict what will come next. What we need are more people like you training for the actual fight today. Thank you.